Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray for our sister back here who's having a little difficulty there. Let's just have a word of prayer while they help her right now, would you? Father, we just love you and come today and thank you for the grace that flows from the cross and the mercy tree. Thank you for the love that you show and demonstrate for us continually. Lord, we just lift our sister up right now to you and ask you to touch her and minister to her, whatever that need is, and those who would minister to her as well, Father. You'd be glorified during this time in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank God we have people here who are capable of taking care of that, so I'm going to stay out of the way. Amen. <laughs> Listen, we're talking over the last several weeks about the way of the cross. I've been going through the journey of the last hours, literally, uh, the day before the crucifixion where Jesus has been in the upper room, washed the disciples' feet, has dealt with those issues. And today we're going to keep moving down that road. I uh, was reading the other day about during the French Revolution, which was a unique time philosophically in the world as people were, you know, uh, coming to all different kinds of ideas. And there was a man who decided he was going to start a new religion and he believed that religion was superior to Christianity. He'd figured it all out and worked it all out and but he was disappointed at his lack of success to be able to uh, kick that religion in gear and get things going. He was extremely frustrated, to which he called a local pastor and a clergyman, and he got with him. He said, listen, you know, I've got all these ideas, and it seems so great and seems so brilliant, but it just doesn't seem to be catching on. I just can't find any success of getting this religion started. And uh, he said, he asked this pastor, well, what do you think, you know, uh, being a clergyman, what do you think we could do to get this, get this thing off the road? And he said, well, <clears throat> I think I have a plan that you might want to consider if you want it to be successful. He said, well, what, what would that be? He said, well, why don't you uh, leave here now and go get yourself crucified, be dead for three days and come back from the dead. I think that might work for you. To which he implied and replied, uh, that's impossible. You know, people still hold that, that fallacy and that myth today that it's not impossible. There's one who did it. It was the son of God. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. After being crucified, dead in the tomb for three days, he rose successfully from the grave. Amen. <clears throat> it took the death and the resurrection of Jesus to produce not a religion, but really to bring man into a real relationship back with the father through the son that you and I can have life through Jesus Christ. It's not about following a set of rules and a set of orders and a, some kind of ritualistic process. It's about coming to a place where we turn from our own sin and from ourselves to discover real life. And that life is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we've gone over the last several weeks, the narrative of those last hours, we've looked all the way up to last week as we went through the six trials of Jesus, you know, that he endured three before the Gentiles and three of those trials before the Jews and the, and the Sanhedrin. Uh, now we come to the place where the cross appears on the Via Della Rosa. The, it's, it's the place where Jesus gives his life. I also want to talk about that as well as the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, how he conquered death. Uh, there's a popular theory for those who hate Christianity and those who would deny the, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ. And that popular theory is what some have called the swoon theory. It's gone by other names, but the, the fact that Jesus didn't die, that's, that's, that's the popular theory that gives them an out over a resurrection. If Jesus didn't die, then certainly there can be no resurrection from the dead. And there's all kinds of theories and excuses that go along with that. Some say, well, Jesus, uh, uh, he, 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 he did die, but the disciples stole the body or that the, the religious leaders of the day stole the body or the house. So really, he didn't die and he recovered. It took a few days in the tomb to find a recovery, but he did recover after some time. Uh, the question before us today that I want to present and then also the evidence of the resurrection is, did Jesus die? Did he really die on the cross? And I think the history has written it and has proven that Jesus really did die on the cross. Now, some think that this particular theory called the swoon theory, that he just really passed out and they mistook him for dead and they took him to the tomb and they wrapped his body in the linens and they buried him there. But that's really just, you know, that, that he, res, he was resuscitated, self-resuscitated in the coolness of the tomb and came out of the grave all by himself. But if you look at the facts and you look at history, you'll see that's not true. You know, in, in truth, that part of that, that philosophy or that teaching about the swoon theory, it dates back a long, long time. It goes back even, you can read the swoon theory in the Quran. 
In the Quran, it talks about how Jesus really didn't die. The Muslims teach that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was a good man and he was a prophet, but he really didn't die. That he just kind of passed out. And then after some time in the, in the, empty, in the tomb there, he recovered himself, you know, and, and, and he walked out of that, you know, out, out, of, the, out of the tomb alive. And uh, the disciples just mistook him for dead and they buried him early. But Jesus really just kind of, you know, got over all of it in a matter of a couple of days and, and walked out of the tomb alive. Uh, that the cool, damp air is the way it goes. That the, in, the, in the tomb, in the coolness of that, 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 that rock tomb, somehow his body just kind of healed itself and he tore open the garments that he was wrapped in of, of the linen clothes and he pushed away that stone that was in front of the tomb and overcame the guards that were there and, you know, he, really, he was really never dead. Uh, I want to re- take a moment, and this may seem like a ludicrous argument for some of you, but to really look at the facts that Jesus did die on the cross, all right? The ordeal, remember, let's go back to what we talked about a little bit last week. The ordeal really began in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke, it says, in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. There was an intense battle physically as well as spiritually that was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus was engaged in. And you know that we talked about last week how how severely it was affecting him, even physically, even to the point, as this passage says, that he was sweating. It's great drops of blood. It's a high likelihood that what, what he experienced is what doctors call today hematidrosis. It's a, it's a mixing of sweat and blood that's created by pressure and severe stress and severe strain. And uh, it, it, just in experiencing that alone, Jesus would have experienced a great, great physical dehydration. If you've ever had to experience dehydration before, you know how severe that can be. It can be even life-threatening. So it's It's pretty safe to say that what Jesus is experiencing, just looking at the picture of it all, that he's already experiencing a great deal of physical stress at this point. From there, he began to continue this physical suffering as he went through these questioning of the different trials in Luke 22. It talks about how they beat him. In John, it talks about how they struck him in the face. In Mark, they continued the beatings. So he's being physically abused along with these other physical elements that he's already facing. Add to that, as we talked about last week, the flogging. These floggings by the Romans were terribly brutal. They usually consisted of 39 lashes, but sometimes would go over that or might be lessened by that, depending on the mood of of the particular soldier that was applying the blows. But the scourge was designed to inflict terrible, massive physical damage to the body. And we described that to you last week. Medical experts say that Jesus would most likely have experienced what we call hypovolemic shock. That means there's been an extreme loss of the blood because of all the bleeding that's been going on, this high volume of blood, there's there's a very low volume of blood in his body. When that happens, it causes the heart to begin racing because it's trying to pump more blood that isn't there into the body. The blood pressure begins to drop severely, sometimes causing fainting. The kidneys stop producing the fluids and urine to maintain blood level, that, that whatever was left. The person at this point, already extremely dehydrated, is craving even now of water because of the massive loss of fluid that he's gone through. So you see the condition already. And the Bible tells us that they, he was made to carry his own cross until he actually fainted under the load. And then we know Simon Serene was called into, into duty by the Romans that were gathered there. And Simon has to carry the cross up to Golgotha. In fact, he's the only man ever in history, by the way, who was compelled to carry the cross. If we're going to follow Jesus, we will do that voluntarily because we love him. But so they go out and it says, and it was 9 a.m. and they crucified him. Now, crucifixion had one goal, death. All right. It was to kill you. And it was a brutal, agonizing death. Ultimately, it was a death by asphyxiation. Because what they would do is they take Jesus out to, to, to be crucified. They would take those large spikes. Some people say eight to nine inch spikes would be driven through the hands. And then another probably larger spikes, 12 inch spikes. It would be, you have to do that for me because it's not going. 12 inch spikes would be driven through, through the ankles and, and, and through the feet. The asphyxiation would happen because you couldn't push yourself up after a while. You'd be so, so uh, distressed and needing a breath that you have to pull yourself against the nails, push against the nails in your ankles just to grab another breath. So Jesus is in agony as well as the two thieves that are there. They've taken him to this place called Golgotha. It literally means the place of the skull. Golgotha, just outside the city limits of Jerusalem, served three purposes. One, it was a garbage dump. 
That's where the refuge and the filth of the city would go. Two, it was an open grave. Those who lived in dire poverty, and it was great in Jerusalem at this time, would die in the streets with no one to take care of them and no one to pay for their funerals. Their bodies would be dragged off to the place of the skull. And there were literally skulls. They were all over the ground in this place called Golgotha. The third service that Golgotha was there for was for crucifying. They would take victims there. It's the place of Roman execution. There Jesus is nailed to the cross. Now during this, this, this crucifixion, the nerves are just firing off every signal of pain. It's going through the body, through the chest. It causes the, even the, the diaphragm itself to go into massive spasms. So asphyxiation, death by asphyxiation was the goal of a crucifixion. But we know, scripture tells us, that Jesus didn't die this way. Roman soldiers would come as the, as the, when, when they were tired of the, the process uh, of watching people in agony, they would come with a club to break the legs of anybody that's still surviving. Now that was done so that you couldn't push yourself up to get another breath. You couldn't hold your weight up. So they'd break the legs so you eventually collapse and die. But when they came to Jesus, history records that Jesus had already given up the ghost. He said, it is finished. We remember what the Bible tells us. And he offered up his spirit to the Lord and he died. Now, we, we know that when they came to Jesus, seeing that he was already dead, just to make sure, because Romans know how to make sure someone dies. And the sentence was for Jesus to die. They're carrying out the official sentence. So they take a spear and they run it into the side and to, to, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says that, that the water and the blood came pouring forth. The wound that was created, the hole, bled water and blood. Jesus' death was not by asphyxiation. Literally, you could say he died of a broken heart, an exploded heart. In fact, it was called, it's called pericardial effusion or, or plural effusion. When the spear was placed in the side of Jesus, all the water and, the, and all the blood that had mixed and erupted out in, in the chest cavity just came flowing out. There's no question, there's no doubt that at this point, Jesus is dead, all right? He's dead. There's no mistaking, is he swooned, is he passed out, has he fainted? He's dehydrated, he's bled out, and he's dead. He was condemned to die, and there is no doubt in the fact of that death and in the, the whole situation that there was, that, that situation, that, that crucifixion was carried out very well, and it was completed to the end, and Jesus died on the cross. There, there's just no credible historian, as you read through history, that denies that Jesus died on the cross. You might see it in the Quran, but it's not in history, all right? There's valid evidence. So from there, he's taken, placed in the tomb, sealed with a stone, and he's buried. But thank God for Easter morning. Because up from the grave, he arose. <laughs> he lives today. Now, I just want to take, there, there's an overwhelming amount of data out there, people, that you can find for yourself and research for yourself that shows that Jesus rose from the dead. But let me just break it into some what we might call bite-sized chunks for us to, to, to take today and, and, and to savor over. In fact, let's just take it like this. There, there are those who say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, but let's just present it in courtroom fashion today. Let's say you're sitting in the courtroom. Better yet, let's just put you in the jury box, all right? So you're part of the jury. And we're going to take before the court today and we're going to prove that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. In fact, by the way, there's been a lot greater legal minds than mine to pour over this and to research the data and to come away with the facts that Jesus has risen from the dead. In fact, many great lawyers throughout history have sought to prove Jesus' resurrection was mythological and it was fiction only to come away themselves and give their life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, knowing they couldn't disprove it. Because when you come up with the facts, the facts require a decision. And the decision is to repent and to believe and to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The opening argument would, would go something like this, you know, that we, we want to present to you today. Not, not a crime, but a claim. A claim that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That everything that I believe, everything that if you're a Christian, you believe, hinges on this particular claim. 
Jesus is risen from the dead. The apostle Paul said, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is useless. In fact, the word really meant renders our faith is worthless. What's the use of trusting Jesus if he did not do what he said he would do? He claimed himself that he would rise from the dead on the third day. He made that declaration. There are those who say, well, it never happened. Well, let me say this. If it never happened, then Christianity simply collapses into mythology and billions of people have been deceived. On the other hand, if it did happen, it authenticates the facts. Jesus died on the cross just as he said he would. He rose from the dead just as he said he would. And billions of believers have the guarantee of eternal life and the forgiveness of their sins because of what he's done. The Bible says in Acts 1, 3, that after suffering, he showed himself to the men and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. In fact, let me just give you some convincing proofs this morning. In fact, let me just, I want to lay out three convincing proofs this morning. I think we'll seal the case. There's many other things we could say, but we'll keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it simple. Convincing proof, exhibit A for the court today is this, the empty tomb. The first piece of evidence is that there is an empty tomb. And Acts says, not only did he show himself, don't get ahead of me back there, Frank. Keep your hands off the keyboard now. Exhibit A, there's this empty tomb that Jesus comes and presents himself that he's alive and gives these convincing proofs. Now, the empty tomb, you know, it, it has to be understood that it was occupied before because they put Jesus in that tomb. Not only is it clear that they put Jesus in that tomb, that they sealed that tomb. Not only did they put him in there, they wrapped him in linens, put about 100 pounds of spices on him, and it's extensively wrapped in strips of linen cloth. A very large stone, estimated to have weighed about two tons, is rolled in front of the entrance tomb. Then there's a contingent of up to 16 Roman soldiers that are assigned to secure the tomb. Now, I know some of you have seen some of the pictures or movies, and you got a couple of guys standing around that look like miniskirts and toothpicks or spears, right? And they're the Roman soldiers, and they're a couple of little skinny guys. No, these were gladiators. These guys are warriors. These guys are professional soldiers. They are duty bound to Caesar to carry out their duties seriously and responsibly. They are set there because of rumors, and they're there to keep any rumors from happening. They're standing there. These guys are human fighting machines. Matthew 27 says, so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now, in addition to the Roman guard, they have this temper proof seal on there that's placed there. If anybody breaks that seal, then they must deal with the radical forces of the Roman guard. But what happens? When people arrive to the tomb that Sunday morning, they only see one thing. The soldiers are gone. The seal is broken. The tomb is empty. All that is laying there are the grave clothes. The empty tomb serves as exhibit A. It's a powerful testimony. It is powerful proof that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. Critics, we know throughout centuries have sought to refute this. They've come up with their own stories. Perhaps they say, disciples, they stole the body. The disciples stole the body. The disciples who ran into the dark of night, scared and cowardly, came and took on the Roman guard, beat them up, rolled the stone away, and stole the body of Jesus. It's ridiculous. Or maybe another possibility is that the religious leaders, they, they came and they, they took it from the soldiers. You know that group. They took it from the soldiers and they hid the body. These are the very guys that want to stamp out Christianity. These are the guys who want to do away with the very name of Christ. Do you not believe if they had stolen the body, as some people say they did, that they would have been the very first people to show the body as soon as people began to start the resurrection rumor? But they couldn't produce the body because they didn't have a body because there was no longer a dead body to produce. Jesus had risen to life again. So we have the empty tomb. I believe, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, esteemed members of the court, I believe that Christianity ultimately rises on fall on the truth of that empty tomb. It is the one silent, infallible witness that you cannot get around. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, then where is his body? 
How is it that we can track down and find every tomb of every great religious, so-called great religious leader in history, but we certainly can't find Jesus's. Can't find his body. Why? He's risen from the dead. Every religious leader, we can track it down and we can find it. But the empty tomb validates the claim. Even as Jesus has predicted that he would rise from the dead, it's obvious from the truth that he did. Even obvious from the disciples' behavior when they saw him, they weren't expecting it, even though he told them he would do it. They needed more evidence. Okay, that's exhibit A. Let's move to exhibit B quickly. Exhibit B would be what we call the multiple witnesses, all right? Scripture tells us there's over 515 witnesses that saw him over a 40-day period on 12 different occasions. It says he showed himself to these men, gave them convincing proof that he was alive, and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He's risen from the dead. People saw him physically alive. It was the women he made an appearance to the women in the cemetery. Later the same day, he walked through the closed doors where the disciples were still hiding for fear. And he introduces himself to them again. In the evening, he walked side by side on the road to Emmaus with two men as they made their way down the road. He appeared to believers. He appeared to doubters. He appeared to tough-minded men. He appeared to tender-hearted souls. Several people saw him on multiple occasions. Others saw him alone. Some were with large groups. Some saw him at night. Some saw him during the day. The apostle, when writing a letter to a group of new Christians, the apostle Paul wrote this. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. What I'm telling you is very important. Listen to this. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Some have died or fallen asleep. He's, he's writing to the, the, the church at Corinth. He says, hey, I got 500 plus people you can talk to if you don't believe me. I, let me just illustrate that. Let's say I was in a car accident. I'm driving down the road. Car B comes out, car A, I'm in, I hit him. We get out of the car, we're arguing, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. The officer comes to the scene. Whose fault is it? Well, it's his fault. No, it's his fault. We argue about it. But what if I have one person standing over on the corner who just witnessed the accident and he comes to my, my, my aid and says, Mr. Arms is telling the truth. That car pulled out in front of him. That car is to blame. It's not Mr. Arms' fault. I suppose if you're the police officer, and we have some in the room today, you're going to believe my story a little bit more. There's a, if there's a witness to see what's going on. Let's, let's put it like this. What if the officer arrives to the scene me and Mr. B are arguing about whose accident's fault it is. And all of a sudden, we're on a very busy intersection and a hundred different people come up to bear witness whose fault the accident really was. And they all bear the same witness. Who do you think the officer's gonna believe then? Let's take it to a courtroom. There's still a battle over it. Let's say it happened on a very busy intersection. It's on, uh, on, on, it's, it's on and out before five or 600 people. All these people witness it and we're able to get all of them in court. And everybody steps up 515 witnesses and gives the same testimony. They all say the same thing. Who are we gonna believe? Mr. B over here or Mr. A? <laughs> They're gonna believe that person who has the most credible witnesses who come one after the other and give testimony. In fact, you know, if we lined up 515 witnesses in a courtroom today, gave them 15 minutes to tell their story each, it would take over 129 hours to give that testimony of court time. I think anybody would walk away from the jury or walk out of that trial, out of that courtroom and say, <clears throat> I think I know how that happened. I think I know how that happened. What if there is just someone who steps up though and says, you know, I'd like to say something to the court. Yes, sir, would you please come forward? I just don't believe it. I know what they're all saying, but I don't believe it. Why? I'm a man of science. And I know that dead people don't come back to dead. Maybe after 10 minutes of death, maybe after 15 minutes of death, maybe a little brain stop for 30, 40 minutes. But, you know, nobody comes back after three days. You know, decomposure set in. I mean, it, it's just, it, it, nobody, it's, it's not possible. It doesn't matter what's possible. It matters what's reality. And they say, oh, sir, why should I believe you? Well, I have a PhD in science. I have a doctorate in science. I'm religiously trained. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It's a hoax. 
515 people here, sir, saying just the opposite. They not only say it's not a hoax, they saw him, they touched him, and some of them ate with him. Some of them he cooked for. What are you going to do about that? So you take exhibit A, the empty tomb, and you take exhibit B, and you realize Jesus has this testimony of 500 plus witnesses that he's appeared to, that he's risen from the dead. Listen to the way Peter, he's about 45 days after the fact, 40 days approximately on the button. He, he's in Jerusalem. It's the day of Pentecost and he stands up before thousands of people and listen to his words. He's in the heart of Jerusalem, right where it all took place, right where the trials were, right where the scourging was, right where the crucifixion was. The city saw it take place. They said he knew he was dead. And what does Paul say, Peter say to them? God has raised this same Jesus to life and we are all witnesses to that fact. That's a powerful word, is it not? Happened right here. You saw it yourself. In fact, he wrote later to the church. He said, we're not following cleverly devised tales. We make known the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Exhibit B. Exhibit C, if we need another. Change lives. Change lives. Everybody who saw him, everybody who knew him experienced a changed life. Their hearts were changed. Their lives were changed. Those who met Jesus were radically transformed. Something happened to them that radically reoriented even the whole group of the followers that were with him. John 20 says this, on the evening of the first day of the week, Easter Sunday evening, the disciples were together with the doors locked out of fear and Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be unto you, peace be with you. And he showed him his hands and he showed him his side, the scripture says. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And by the way, you know, catch this. Here's the guys who've been fearful and been cowardly and have been hiding out. And Jesus shows up. He doesn't condemn them. He doesn't berate them. He says, peace be with you. You may be here today and you've been living a life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you haven't submitted your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's not here to condemn you. The Bible says we're already in trouble. We're already condemned. But he that believeth is not condemned. The sentence of death is released. We are set free from the bondage of, and the fear of death and death itself because Jesus walked out of the grave as victor over death. The disciples themselves, look at the testimony of their changed lives. There's these men who are facing death the scrutiny of everyone around them have every opportunity before they die to renounce Jesus. And why wouldn't they? If he's not dead, if he just passed out, if he just swooned in the tomb, then why are you going to let somebody take your head off? I mean, look, look down the list there. The list is, is pretty clear. Matthew, he was killed in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged through the streets until he was dead. Peter, Simon, Andrew, Philip, they were all crucified. James was beheaded. Bartholomew was beaten, flayed alive. Thomas was pierced with lances. James the less was thrown from the temple and then stoned to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. John was boiled in hot oil. I mean, just go through the list and see what happened to him. Paul beheaded. These guys had experienced Jesus. If he wasn't risen, if it was just a matter of passing out even, or if they're just lying about the resurrection, at the facing ultimately the final verdict of death, I would certainly say this ain't worth dying for if it's not true. This is not worth paying the price for if it's not true. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is true. It is true. There was no backing apart. There's no backing down. If he's dead, forget about it, but he's not dead. And the resurrected Jesus so impacted the lives of these individuals and these men had such transforming power on their life. Now, from the third decade of the first century on to this very moment today, the resurrection of Jesus is still impacting lives. Billions of people have come to know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior since the resurrection. Billions of people's lives have been transformed by the power of the resurrection. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead changes our lives today. I stake my life on it. And I tell you very clearly, you don't have to listen to but a few minutes of my testimony that Jesus changed my life. And from talking to many of you that I know personally, he's changed your life as well. And that life changing power is just available as available to anyone in this audience today who's willing to surrender their heart and their life. Closing argument. 
How do you explain away the empty tomb? You can't. It's not reasonable. All these other excuses and stealing the body, breaking the stone, all the, beating the it's not going to happen. How do you argue against 500 plus witnesses? And how do you get away from the fact that this risen Lord has changed billions and billions of lives? So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what's your verdict? Fact or fiction? How do you rule this morning? What testimony are you going to give? Is it fact? Is it fiction? Obviously, it's fact. Now, some of you are, are bored with the facts. <laughs> some of you have heard the facts. You know, you have so much data floating around your head, so many bits of information. It's just something else to store, you know, something else put back there. But for someone who's made a commitment to that resurrected Lord, it's more than just more information and factual truths. It's no good to believe that Jesus is the son of God. It's no good just to believe that he, he died for your sins. It's no good to even believe that Jesus rose from the dead without faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you've not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is not going to do you any good. In fact, one day we'll have to stand before the judge, the true judge, the God almighty himself, at the great bar of heaven, at the greatest courtroom that exists and the highest authority of the, all the earth and land and cosmos and give an account for our verdicts. If it's fact, then it's worth putting your life in Jesus' hands. If it's fact, it's worth turning from yourself and turning to the Savior. If it's fact, it's worth giving your heart to Jesus. And I would say today, if that hadn't happened in your life, the facts are not doing you any good. This is good news, but it's good news is to be believed. It's good news to be received. It's good news to be embraced. Why don't you give your life to Christ today? What more, what more facts do you need? You're going to listen to the, sooth, the, 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 the soothsayers of our age who try to explain away the facts? Or to believe a lie? To embrace a lie? Say, well, I just don't believe it. I'd rather believe a lie. It always leads us, if we're really going to be honest with ourselves... Facts always demand a verdict. And the verdict is that the claim is not fiction. The verdict is that the claim of the resurrection is facts. Give your life to Christ today. Give your heart. If you're a Christian and you're living outside the will of God, and you know what I mean by that, and you're living outside God's will for your life, get right with God today. Get your heart right with God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that will give you the ability to live for Christ today. The Holy Spirit works in the hearts and lives of people whose hearts are surrendered. Surrender your heart again to Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, what better opportunity, and by the way, what better day than Easter, Resurrection Day, than to find the resurrection reality in your own life that God raised you from the dead today. Let's stand with our heads bowed.